as far as I'm aware, there are no other official announcements. So without further ado, I'd like to turn towards the motion put before the House tonight. This House believes that we are all feminists now. And I'd like to invite the Honourable Member, Michael Belloff, ex-president, to open the case for the proposition. Madam President, uh, may I congratulate you belatedly on your election and hope you're enjoying the many benefits it has brought in its wake. One of those you recently revealed to me was an invitation to lunch from Julian Assange. On this St. Valentine's Day, I respectfully advise you to decline that invitation. <laughs> and for two reasons. The second of which is that the food at the Ecuadorian embassy leaves much to be desired. <laughs> and the first is that so does Julian Assange. <laughs> may, may I in particular congratulate you on staging this debate exactly 50 years almost the day after I had the good fortune successfully to move the motion that secured women full membership of this society. It may be very difficult for all save the greybeards in the chamber tonight to appreciate that the admission of women was so hotly contested. It was as controversial in Oxford then as gay marriage might be seen to be in the nation as a whole today. It took two votes in successive terms, and even on the second occasion, there was a substantial minority, 427 votes to the majority of 10, 1,039. One opponent was John Sparrow, the legendary Warden of All Souls, whose major contribution to scholarship was a meticulous analysis of the various forms of physical congress which took place between Lady Chatterley and her gamekeeper. <laughs> the warden brought his father from London to vote. He was a man who achieved what experts in human psychology thought to be quite impossible. That's to say he was even more conservative than his son. <laughs> Another opponent was a retired vicar from Cowley. He suggested that female undergraduates could always join the YMCA. <laughs> I indulged in correspondence with him in the Oxford Mail, and I ended my letter by quoting the words of another rather more famous cleric, the Reverend Sidney Smith, who said, there are three sexes, men, women, and clergymen. <laughs> To which I added, somewhat pompously, because I was then young, the union has never discriminated against the third category. It is time it stopped discriminating against the second. <laughs> Lost for a further retort, the Cowley vicar resigned his life membership. The union, as you can tell, bore his departure with such fortitude as it could muster. <laughs> but the spirit of reaction is not entirely dead in our green and pleasant land. Yesterday I received an email from a Mike Buchanan, the self-styled leader of the Anti-Feminism League, who claims to be the founder of a new political party which he's called Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. <laughs> I, suspect, I suspect that that third category represents, in his case, the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Buchanan inquired of me whether tonight's motion, we're all believed feminists now, was not the most ludicrous proposition ever debated in the Union. Well, it is ludicrous, but in quite the opposite way to that intended by Mr. Buchanan, because there is, in fact, no answer to it. The order paper before you makes the point for me. Here I stand, the token man, among a galaxy of female talent, prominent in every sphere of our national life. I'd call them the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> now, it's one of the happier conventions of this society that the first speaker introduces the guests. And I have, as you will tell, politely ignored that convention. And that's simply because 
The other speakers are all household names. I, for my part, I'm not even a household name in my own household. <laughs> But I cannot resist noting that one at least of my fellow speakers is herself a product of Oxford of the swinging 60s. Edwina Curry Cohen, as she then was, she was already recognisable as a young person in a hurry, rivalled in her Oxford generation only by a certain Geoffrey Archer. Incidentally, I never did discover what happened to Geoffrey in later life. Uh, because Edwina and I were up together, I must take this opportunity to assure the House that when she publishes her next volume of diaries about her undergraduate life, I have nothing to fear. <laughs> Nor, indeed, does my underwear. Fame at last. If you want to intervene now, Edwina, this is your chance. <laughs> Oxford in 19... <laughs> We're all getting invitations tonight. <laughs> uh, 1963 was famous for other things than the admission of women to the Oxford Union. The poet Philip Larkin memorably wrote, Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, that's for him, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. And sex, indeed, remained on the top of the agenda during the same decade. I remember when I was a young law lecturer at Trinity, then, of course, a single-sex college, attending a meeting of the governing body when there was a fierce debate about the hours when women could be admitted to the college could be extended at night from 10 until 10.30. The senior fellow was vehemently against this modest reform. He saw it as heralding the end of civilization as we knew it. <laughs> Eventually, I piped up from my end of the table, and I said, what senior fellow do you think that a young man and a young woman could do between 10 and 10.30 that they couldn't, if so inclined, do before 10? <laughs> Ah, he responded, with all the wisdom of ages, but they could do it again. <laughs> Nonetheless, the change was made. And when Trinity, like other Oxford colleges, and even indeed Cambridge colleges, saw the light and became fully educational, and when I returned to Trinity as its president, and we had one of those unannounced fire alarms early in the morning, and everyone had to congregate on the college lawns. I remember telling the domestic bursa that it was quite clear that we had spare capacity in at least half of our rooms. <laughs> in every walk of life over the last 50 years, we've seen the irresistible rise of women. When I was called to the bar by Gray's Inn, 7% of those called with me were women. But when I was fortunate to be treasurer of the same inn five years ago, the number I called had risen to over 50%. The next Lord Chief Justice may well be a woman. We've already had our first woman Prime Minister. The majority of our gold medal Olympians were women. And not only is our head of state, of course, a woman, but the law's been changed to ensure that there will, from now on, be no discrimination between the sexes and succession to the throne. And if the much-photographed baby bump is in fact a girl, I can envisage her being crowned by a female archbishop, being able to play golf at the royal and ancient in St Andrews, and even, be still my beating heart, become a member of the Garrick. And who knows, in the not too distant future, when John Terry, with his happy and felicitous command of the English language, <laughs> calls yet another opponent on the football field an effing black sea, it'll be generally recognised at last that the noun is at least as offensive as the adjective. Well, I could go on and on, but my ten minutes is nearly up. And I did learn a salutary lesson about the virtues of brevity when I was at Trinity. On the first night of the new academic year, I addressed all the freshers in the hall. And I noticed one young man who went out during my speech. 
And the next day, when I saw him on a one-to-one -one basis, I asked him why he had left. And he replied, well, President, I needed to shave. And I responded, perhaps a little testily, but couldn't you have shaved before I started my speech? Well, President, he said, I didn't need to shave then. <laughs> Well, what's the motto of this little tale? It's this. We may not all be, in fact, we clearly are not all female, but we can all and should be feminists. So, Madam President, the first Russian to attain your office, you who combine all the best qualities of Maria Sharapova, <laughs> none of the worst qualities of President Putin, I beg to move the motion standing in my name.